Good morning. Um, my name is Kimberly McKee. I'm the director of the Coochie Office of Local History, and I'm really excited to welcome you to Lesser Known Women in West Michigan History. Um, this presentation, we actually had initially had hoped it to be part of our 2020 annual local history roundtable. So we're really excited that it's part of our 2021 annual local history roundtable. Um, the Coochie Office of Local History is housed in the Brooks College of Interdisciplinary Studies at GBSU, and our office's mission is to give voice to diverse communities through history. We do so through a variety of events and programs, one of which, one of which is through our annual local history roundtable. And as you might have seen through our promotional materials, it's looking a little bit different this year as we're doing the events all throughout the month of March. Um, please note that you can ask questions during in the Q&A feature. Uh, if you have additional questions for our panelists, we'll be having Q&A at the end of their presentations today. We will not necessarily get to all audience questions, so thank you, you know, for your patience with that. Additionally, we are recording this webinar and it will be available online later this week. Um, and so, before we get started, um, just another quick housekeeping thing. We have three presenters today. Um, our presenters are from the Ionia County Historical Society, the Lakeshore Museum Center, and the Ada Historical Society. Going first, um, we will have David McCord. And David McCord is a fifth generation Ionian and vice president of the Ionia County Historical Society where he wears a number of hats. He's made a living with graphic design, illustration, and both performing and teaching music. He's a woodworker, scout leader, a family man, and a designer and collector of board games. David's favorite aspect of historical study is reenactment, helping people visualize what life was like in Ionia town in the 19th century. So I'm really excited um, for us to listen to David's presentation. After that, we will move on and listen to Brenda Nemitz's presentation from the Lakeshore Museum Center, and then Kristen Wild from the Ada Historical Society. Welcome, David. Hello, am I on? I'm unmuted. Yes, you are. Okay, very yeah. good. Well, good morning, and thanks for uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I I probably should say I've rehearsed for a whole year now for this little presentation, but um, but I haven't. So we'll uh, we'll just see how it goes. Um, so shall I uh, share my screen and get started? Sounds great. All right. Oops, okay. Um, my presentation this morning is on a woman named Nina Kate Preston. This picture is Clark and Sarah. Clark and Sarah Preston were her parents. Uh, they moved to Ionia in the late 1850s from New York State, like so many other immigrants of Michigan. They brought with them two young children and settled on a farmstead near the southern border of County of Ionia. Uh, this photo was of Clark and Sarah was taken around 1880. A um, few years later, the family moved into Ionia Village, and uh, when Clark returned from service in the Civil War, he became a successful merchant in the town. Nina Kate was born in on April 19th, 1874, and was the third of four Preston children. Shortly after she was born, they moved into this comfortable home at 223 North Jackson Street, where the family lived for many years. Nina and her siblings attended the Third Ward School just a few blocks from their home. They generally lived an average life with a comfortable home, a respectable income, and a live-in servant girl. The family were members of the Church of Christ on Washington Street. The earliest mention of Nina in print reports that she presented the Ionia congregation, represented the Ionia congregation at a con convention of the Christian Women's Board of Missions at Paw Paw in the summer of 1889 when she was 15. There she presented the group with $5.22 on behalf of the light bearers of Ionia. Nina excelled as a scholar and graduated from Ionia High School in 1890. She went on to higher education at the University of Michigan in 1902 and 03, and received a certification from the library department of the Drexel Institute in Philadelphia 
in 1903. At this time, many communities were enjoying the generosity of Andrew Carnegie and public libraries of every flavor were getting a lot of attention throughout the land. Miss Preston's certificate opened the door to a significant career, which she probably never imagined. The same year that Nina earned that professional recognition, a classmate of hers named Marion Hall Fowler donated her father's mansion to the city of Ionia to be used as a public library. This picture is of the mansion in 1884, right after the mansion was built. Uh, Marion was the daughter of Frederick Hall, one of the richest men in the county, and this huge Italianate home remains one of Ionia's proudest landmarks. At a meeting of the library board on August 14th of 1903, Nina Preston was hired for the position of librarian for one year at $50 per month. Miss Preston took to her new duties with enthusiasm, one might say with vigor. Within a few years, she became highly involved in the Michigan Library Association, where she was elected treasurer in 1907 and was described as being always a pleasing speaker. She also served as secretary and for two terms as president of the Michigan Library Association in 1910 and 1911. While she continued to serve at the Ionia Library, she began to advocate for the establishment of community libraries, even where the residents might not have a library building to serve from. She told her audiences that library boards in small towns and rural areas could still serve through schools, storefronts, and spare rooms, setting the stage for later developments. In 1912, Nina Preston proposed to the Library Association that they support and formalize much of the field work she and others had been doing. And this led to the establishment of library roundtables with Miss Preston as the chairman. In 1915, Miss Preston was granted a year's leave of absence from the Ionia Public Library to fulfill her duties as Michigan's first library visitor. It was a full time, she was a full time traveling speaker for the Michigan State Library Commission. Under Nina's direction, the Library Commission's visitors provided much needed help to community libraries, school systems, and county normal schools. Nina was recognized many times over as playing a key role in the progress of libraries throughout Michigan. She continued her regimen of constant travel around the state, visiting in one year 80 different communities. The Michigan Library Bulletin of 1919 recorded the following. You would have to see the condition, feel the hopelessness of some localities, understand the limitations of some of the librarians, realize the narrowness of some of the taxpayers, and yet withal be able to grasp the meaning of the pushing, questioning spirit of better, finer, greater things for Michigan. The library visitor let these communities know that there was someone who knows and cares. <clears throat> Ms. Preston resigned her position as visitor in 1920, unable to keep up the demanding pace of the office. Upon her retirement, the bulletin reported, in working up interest in the establishment of new libraries, she is wise and patient, setting herself to study the problems of individual communities with thoroughness. She has perhaps placed more librarians than anyone else in Michigan. The state board have counted largely upon Miss Preston's advice and opinion. Passing along her legacy of field work to others, Miss Preston accepted a position at the University of Michigan Library in Ann Arbor. She quickly became a key member of the staff. She was also a charter member and secretary of the Ann Arbor Library Club. By 1929, she was a department supervisor and senior cataloger at the U of M library, where she served until her retirement in 1943. She continued to work on behalf of literacy and education throughout the 1940s, active in organizations in Ann Arbor and Lansing, and often visiting family and friends in her town of Ionia. That's her in the middle of the back row. Miss Preston had been living in Ann Arbor with her widowed sister, Hassie. Hassie died in 1946, and Nina lived there 
until February 19th, 1953. That's when she died. At the age of 78, while visiting friends in South Haven, she's buried with the rest of the Preston family at Highland Park Cemetery in Ionia. Her legacy lives on, not only here in the Ionia Community Library, still in service after 118 years, but in dozens of communities throughout the state of Michigan, where she's helping to bring life, where she helped to bring life to many small town libraries throughout her infectious enthusiasm, her tireless efforts, and organizational talents. That was Nina Kate Preston. Well, I just want to thank you, David, for such a wonderful presentation. And just for a reminder for folks who have joined in a little, a few minutes late, please note that the webinar is being recorded and will be available online later on this week. Um, and David, we look forward to uh, asking you some questions during our Q&A. So mm -hmm. next, I'm going to be introducing Brenda Nemet. And Brenda is Collections Manager of the Lakeshore Museum Center in Muskegon. She oversees the research, care, and preservation of a collection spanning from prehistory to present day. Working in museums for the past 10 years, she previously served as collections manager and exhibit curator at the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts. She received a master's degree in cultural anthropology from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. So I can't wait to listen to your presentation, Brenda. Hello. Um, so again, I'm, I'm Brenda Nemitz. I'm the collections manager uh, at the Lakeshore Museum Center. We're in Muskegon, Michigan. Um, and today I'm discussing the life of Rosie Lee Wilkins. Um, she is featured in a current exhibit at the museum titled, uh, Rosie, Who is Rosie Lee Wilkins? Uh, piecing Together Her History. So the title um, originated about eight months ago when my colleague and I kept asking that question as we started research for this exhibit. We had her name, we knew she lived in Muskegon, um, we had quilts she made, but each path that uh, we took to find out more about her life became a dead end. And what we uncovered was not a woman who was unknown in her community, but a woman who was unknown only to us at the museum. So uh, in May of last year, our former exhibit designer, Kate Curdo and I started to discuss this exhibit on quilts. And we found that although there were many quilts in the museum's collection, these were, um, none of them were really thought to have been made by women of color. And this created kind of a complete omission of really important stories about our community. So with that, we started to look more broadly at quilting in Muskegon County. Our research started with uh, Michigan State University Museum, which for over 30 years has documented quilts and their makers. Um, and they also oversee a public database called the Quilt Index. And there's two screenshots of, of the MSU collection, as well as the Quilt Index, which is a fantastic resource. And it was the staff at MSU that um, gave us the name of a quilter from Muskegon, and her name was Rosie Wilkins. And that's Rosie. Um, in her lifetime, Rosie created over 100 quilts. She started quilting in the early 1900s while growing up in Mississippi and continued quilting until her death in 1994. While Rosie was a prolific quilter whose work had been exhibited across Michigan, her story and quilts were never displayed in her hometown of Muskegon. Moreover, when I searched the Lakeshore Museum's collection and archives, there was nothing about her or her work. So due to this lack of representation in our own collection, we were able to borrow quilts from the MSU collection and their staff helped put us in contact with the private collector of Rosie's quilts. Um, and you see an early photo we received um, of Rosie's quilts from that collector on the right. Um, and the photographs were part of a series of interviews Rosie participated in with MSU um, in the late 1980s. Unfortunately, due to COVID, um, the staff at MSU were furloughed and we couldn't access those interviews. Um, it's just frustrating as a researcher knowing that there's an audio recording in a building and you just, um, you can't get to it. 
So we had to start from the beginning and just began gathering data. Um, we used the MSU Quilt Index website and we knew from there that Rosie had five children. So going into this project, it became so crucial to me to find these descendants of Rosie and make sure that they could have an input on the exhibit. And as we learned more about Rosie and her accomplishments, I started questioning why our museum had completely overlooked this woman. So this exhibit and the associated research about her life became a solution to what we saw as a problem, which was the omission of quilts made by women of color in our collection at the museum. And within the exhibit, we did include a statement acknowledging our bias, which you can see here, um, the screenshot of the label, as well as um, where it is in the exhibit, it's right when you walk in. It was important for us to include this because not only does it admit the problem and, and why this exhibit came about, but it also holds us accountable to make these changes in the future, that this is not the end, this is really just the start. So from MSU, we learned that in February of 1986, both MSU, Muskegon Community College, and the Muskegon County Cooperative Extension Service, they hosted the first in a series of African American Community Quilt Discovery Days throughout Michigan. And during the event, the stories of 30 quilters were recorded, and that included Rosie Wilkins. These stories were combined to create an exhibit called African American Quilt Making in Michigan, and in the late 80s and early 90s, this exhibit traveled across the state. The interviews and select quilts were also featured in a book by the same name, written by Marcia McDowell of MSU, which you see on the far uh, left there. Um, and then the Great Lakes Great Quilts feature some of Rosie's quilts. That's a selection of quilts from the MSU collection. And then in 1987, the Smithsonian Institution hosted its annual Festival of Folk Life in Washington, DC. And Rosie was one of 90 participants selected to represent the state of Michigan and its cultural traditions. And there's an image of her on the right. Um, she's in the foreground in that lower corner uh, talking to individuals about her quilts. Also while she was there, the Smithsonian interviewed her about her experience moving from Mississippi to Michigan during the second great migration. And finally, in 1989, the Michigan Women's Historical Center and Hall of Fame displayed Rosie's quilts in a solo exhibit titled Quilts of Rosie Lee Wilkins, Improvisational Quilt Making in the African American Tradition. Rosie was a talented and unique quilt maker. And what I love about my job is that I get these really up close experiences with objects when I catalog. And so I had seen Rosie's um, quilts in that small photo, but to see them in person, you immediately can tell how passionate she was about her work. Everything was done by hand from the piecing to the quilting. And she had favorite patterns that would use really subtle variations in her process. But then sometimes you would find a straight pin stuck in her work, um, or in this example here, um, the sleeve for the polyester batting had been accidentally sewn inside. Um, or maybe purposely, I don't know. Um, she could have done it, I guess. Um, and to me, these things just made her seem so much more real. But what the quilt couldn't tell me was about her life. So with the few details I gathered from the quilt index, which you see here, I started to search for vital documents. But I found that there were variations in Rosie's name, her birth year, and just basic details about her life, which made finding her incredibly difficult. So these two sentences taken from the Quilt Index website were all I knew about Rosie uh, without access to those interviews. Uh, Rosie Lee Hanks Wilkins was born in Meridian, Mississippi on August 3rd, 1911. She and her husband, John Wesley Wilkins, moved to Hattiesburg where all five of their children were born. And in 1944, the family moved to Muskegon, Michigan. Um, spoiler. <laughs> Little to none of that uh, tended to be true, as we found through the research. One of our early struggles was that we couldn't find a marriage certificate in either Mississippi or Michigan for Rosie and John Wilkins. And I later found out that the name Rosie Wilkins didn't actually exist before 1963. And on the right um, is a sample of the Register of Deeds database, and there's nothing on there for any other name of Rosie. So I was able to confirm the date of death for Rosie. Um, the Register of Deeds did have a death certificate and the local library found her obituary. 
um, which you see on the right, um, but these have no details about her family. So I contacted the church listed and the members were helpful. They remembered John, they remembered Rosie, um, but they didn't know any of her children. So I started to look through court documents for any mention of Rosie or John. And I found a probate court listing uh, for John and his estate after he died in 1995. And there was an individual listed and I was able to find contact information for him. And I called him, just kind of cold called him, crossed my fingers and hoped that this was it. This was a son of Rosie and John. Um, and it wasn't, but it was a relative. Um, it was a nephew of John's. And despite this individual being over 70 years old, he told me that he didn't actually know Rosie really well. Um, Rosie wasn't around until he was much older. And I found this peculiar and realized that one of these statements was not true. Either the quilt index was not correct and Rosie and John weren't married in Mississippi, or perhaps even the nephew was mistaken. So five months after we started researching Rosie, we knew little more about her. And so I started with a new theory that Rosie had another husband before the 1960s and he was the father of her children. But which one of the many last names and spellings we had for Rosie would help us be the final piece? So I started to look through the Mississippi State Archives website with my new theory. And that's when I finally had a research breakthrough. The State Archives had digitized mid-century ledgers of school-aged children in every county in Mississippi. However, these sometimes up to 300 page ledgers, um, though scanned, were not searchable. So I enlisted a volunteer to help me go page by page in the two counties I knew Rosie lived for the three last names I knew Rosie went by. And on September 9th of 2020, after months of research, I found her and the names of her five children in the 1937 enumeration of educable children of Forest County, Mississippi. And you can see here, she went by uh, the name of Hand. So from there, I went back each year and found the children's names under a JM or James Harrelson. Harrelson was one of the names that we had found associated with Rosie and presumed him to be the father of her children. So from this, I started inputting the children's names and James Harrelson in a family tree on the Ancestry website. I found other public family trees with overlapping branches and contacted those individuals. This momentum led to a relative of Rosie's son-in-law putting me in touch with Rosie's grandson. The day I received a phone call from Rosie's grandson in Texas was a moment that I had been waiting for since I started my research. He shared really personal stories about his grandmother and shared that he was so proud that she was getting the recognition she deserved. But nothing could have prepared me for the next day when my coworker called me and said, I think you were talking to my uncle yesterday. Her uncle from Texas had called her and told her that her museum was doing an exhibit on her great grandmother. And this is my coworker, Lakeisha. Um, all this time we had spent searching for descendants, we really couldn't write a better surprise ending knowing we had this incredibly personal connection to this woman in our own work family. And every day became a new surprise when more and more family members reached out to share their stories. Through documents and family stories, I was finally able to piece together much of Rosie's life. But unfortunately, with the passing of time and the fading of memory, there are still some things that are left unknown. So from the family, I learned that Rosie Lee Hand was born in Meridian, Mississippi on August 3rd, sometime between 1901 and 1911. We couldn't find documents to confirm her birth year and her family couldn't confirm it either. Uh, because as they said, if you asked her how old she was in the last years of her life, Rosie always said she was 78 years old. She went by the name Rose and Rosie and Rosalie, but to everyone she knew, she was Mama or Madeira, and to her two daughters, she was known as Sister. You can see here in the 1910 census, Rosie was living with her grandparents, James and Marcella Hand, on a farm in Tunnel Hill, Mississippi, near Meridian. But there's no mention of what happened to her parents. When she was 16 years old, Rosie married James Harrelson. I found James both in those ledgers as well as in the census records. 
And I found that most of the living descendants either had a vague idea of who he was or actually had not heard of him before. And so by 1920, Rosie and James were living in Hattiesburg, Mississippi with their nine month old daughter, Verdi, as you can see on the top record. Her grandparents lived next door and an uncle lived nearby. Rosie and James had five children together between 1918 and 1927, which you can see listed in the middle census record. But after 1933, there are no more records of James. And five years later, Rosie returned to using her mother's maiden name of Hand, which you can see in the 1940 census. And also the variation, Rosie Harrison, um, Rose Hand, Rosa Harrison, a lot of different misspellings. Rosie lived in Hattiesburg for almost half of her life. And sometime in the late 1940s, Rosie and three of her younger children moved to Michigan. What the records don't tell us is to why Rosie moved there, but according to one of her grandchildren, Rosie's youngest daughter, also named Rosie Lee, most likely moved as part of the migration from the South looking for jobs. And if the daughter got to Muskegon and liked it, Rosie was sure to follow because the two women were quite close. Rosie did remain connected to her family, but by 1952, she was living in Muskegon Heights, Michigan. And you can see the listings of the city directories um, in the lowest one on the lower left, um, Octavius is her younger son who was living with her at the time. And then on the right is a graphic from our exhibit showing all the different places Rosie lived um, during her lifetime. By 1964, Rosie was living with Don Wesley Wilkins. John was also from Mississippi and moved during the Great Migration. He worked in factories in Muskegon while Rosie often worked as a housekeeper. And in 1972, they bought a house together in Muskegon and that's where they lived until their deaths. Rosie died in Muskegon, Michigan on June 24, 1994. And her husband passed away six months later and was buried alongside Rosie. These documents I found only told part of the story about Rosie. Her family and friends were essential in helping to learn more about who she was and how much she meant to them. Family and friends shared how Rosie and John would take them fishing and Rosie used to engineer different types of fishing equipment. And the family would go blueberry picking every year and Rosie was known to pick up to 90 buckets in a day. She was an incredible baker and her grandson shared that after a visit, his car would look like a bakery filled with all the things she made for him. But more importantly, her family told me that they learned from her how to be respectful and how to value those around them. One of the more interesting facts I uncovered about Rosie was how she helped other individuals. During the research, I found that in 1956 and 1957, in the city directories, Rosie was listed as Mrs. Rosie Harris. During those two years, she lived with Zeph Harris. And our initial assumption early in the research was, could this be a husband of Rosie's? And so when I started to talk to family members, I kept asking if they knew who Zeph was and nobody had heard of him. But then one great grandchild mentioned that often Rosie and her daughter would board African-Americans moving from the South to Michigan to help them until they were established in town. And it's interesting to think that this error in a city directory led me to learn more about Rosie's hospitality. More so, it emphasizes how important these family stories are, because without that statement from her great grandson, we would have been left without knowing the relationship between Rosie and Zeph. And also interviewing her family filled out really more about her passion for quilting. Rosie started quilting when she was 11 years old and it was an important part of her life over the years. She would start quilting at noon and sometimes wouldn't stop until two in the morning. Her grandchildren would share stories about coming across Rosie sleeping in a rocking chair with her sewing materials all around her. And Rosie would just wake up and keep sewing in the middle of the night. She would frequently fly to Texas or Mississippi or California to visit her family for months at a time. And she would spread her quilting out in the airports while waiting for her flight. Um, in 1989, Rosie's family arranged a surprise visit for Rosie to see the solo display of her quilts at the Women's Hall of Fame. Rosie had no idea um, what awaited her. And when she arrived, she saw it was an exhibit just on her quilts. And a woman who was known for always having something to say was speechless. 
her granddaughter shared with me that Rosie had looked at the quilt and looked at her and told her, you can do whatever you want, it's possible. I can only hope that if Rosie saw this exhibit in her hometown, she would feel the same sense of pride. Her family that have seen it have expressed how happy she would have been. And when I think of what Rosie's legacy is, I realize I have seen it in every one of the family members I have talked to this past year. It is a message of kindness, of respect, of compassion and gratitude to others. And though I never met Rosie Wilkins, her stories had a tremendous impact on me as a historian. I could not have learned everything I did about her life without the firsthand stories from her family. Every person has a history and a legacy for the next generation, and this exhibit and the documentation of Rosie's life was a reaction to a problem I saw in the collection. Rosie's legacy is one that will contribute to other women being recognized for their accomplishments. Rosie's story has led us the need to change the fundamental practices of collecting and exhibiting at the Lakeshore Museum Center, because it's through her story we have been confronted with our own biases and our move to be better at collecting those in our community and re representing those we are supposed to serve. Oh gosh, Brenda, I have so many questions for you during Q&A too, so thank you. Um, and just as a reminder for folks, this webinar is being recorded and will be available online later this week. I'm pleased to um, provide the and, and introduce our last speaker for uh, today's event. Kristen Wilds is inspired by David McCullough's words, quote, history is who we are and why we are the way we are, end quote. She studied American culture and education at the University of Michigan and master's work in museum studies at the University of Delaware. Kristen is currently exploring all things Ada as museum manager for the Ada Historical Society. Um, I hope that you all will join me in welcoming Kristen this morning um, and I will turn it over to you. All right, let me get fired up here. We are ahead of ourselves. <laughs> All right. So thank you for having me. I'm still reeling over Rosie quilting for those many that many hours until the wee hours of the morning. Her eyes must have been incredible to work on that detailed work. But thanks for sharing those other two stories. Thanks for having me today. As she mentioned, I work in Ada for the Ada Historical Society at the Averill Museum. And we uh, preserve, share, and celebrate the unique history of the Ada community. So I'm particularly gratified that I can share a story of someone who, while um, she is a lesser known woman, these days would have been very well known in her community um, in her day. So thanks for the opportunity to talk about her. And we'll have a little bit of fun with Ma Loveless today. Yes, her name is Ma Loveless, although um, also, like Rosie, she had many names, all of which were her name, but you'll have to keep me honest as I move back and forth. Um, we might call her Ma today, we might call her Blanche, but the one thing to note uh, in a quote from her son is that Ma Loveless was quite a gal, and you'll see what I mean here. This is Sarah Blanche Moon. Um, she went by Blanche uh, much of her life. She was born February 5th, 1894, and she lived 67 years until 1961. And uh, here she is in her early 20s. We have um, in the museum collections in Ada, um, one of our richest treasures that we hold are a series of oral histories that were collected over the years. And a lot of what I have come to learn today is from an oral history of Blanche's daughter. Um, it's really revived our uh, interest in hopefully when COVID is over, being able to continue to collect these oral histories 
they just tell us so much about individuals. Um, we're going to learn a little bit about Blanche today. And by way of introduction, I just want to take a moment to tell you about her background. She was born in Traverse City. I had to throw in the Irish immigrants today. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Cheers. Her grandparents were Irish immigrants. Her father was a doctor in Traverse City and her brother followed uh, into medical school as well. She eventually comes to Grand Rapids for work. That's a portion of her life that we need to research further that we're trying to find out more about. But from Traverse, she ends up working here in Grand Rapids. This gentleman, she meets when she is here in Grand Rapids. His name is Arthur Loveless. She's 24, he's 44. They meet while he is a bartender at a uh, bar down on Canal Street in Grand Rapids. Just to add to the um, confusion on our end, Art calls her Sari. So um, if you're keeping count so far, that's uh, Ma and Sarah and Blanche and Sari. But they do, um, they meet, they fall in love, they get married and they make beautiful music together, which we will continue to talk about. Their child, Helen, is born in 1920. Art, um, Art was from the Howard City area and he was working as a farm laborer there. He came to the Ada area and worked on a farm, uh, the McPherson farm in, on Virgins. And when they were married, the family lived in a variety of places in Ada. So here Helen is sitting in her backyard. Um, he, she, the family lived on Bradfield for a while and Bradfield is a street across the street from the Ada school where um, Art served as janitor. They also lived on Buttrick where he helped raise cattle for the Thornwood Dairy Farm. And they also lived on Bronson Street. All of these in, uh, in and around Ada Village. Helen would go on to marry a man named Ed Dunnebach, who we will talk about a little bit further on down the road. I just wanted to give you a, a sense of who her people are before we talk about her life's work. Helen, by the way, actually, let me go back. Helen, incidentally, um, she attended the Ada school and she, the Ada school only went to 10th grade. And so you would graduate from 10th grade, but in order to complete your high school education, uh, you would go to another area high school. Helen selected Lowell. She graduated from Lowell High School, but then she went on to beauty school, Grand Rapids Beauty School, which was located downtown next to what was Wurzburg's at the time. Back to Blanche, I guess what I'd really like you to know today about this lesser known woman is that um, this is embodied in this quote, when you enjoy what you do, work becomes play. And with Blanche, she worked hard and she had a lot of fun doing it. So let's take a look at how she is working. That line is a little fuzzy for her between work and play. Let's look at working in nursing. Let's look at her work in performing and in serving. So first up is nursing. As I mentioned, Blanche's father was a doctor. Her brother went to uh, Nebraska, Omaha, Nebraska to go to med school. She followed him out there. Blanche was going to become a nurse. And according to her daughter, she contracted diphtheria and some other disease and her, all her hair fell out and she was really sick for a long time. And so she ended up not completing her nurse's training. 
She got well along into it, but was not able to complete it. And then here's that fuzzy part. She ends up moving to Grand Rapids. We just need some more information on that part. But she moved here and she was working um, using her training at the Veterans Hospital in Comstock Park. Um, throughout her life, she continued this work. And we're talking, you know, you have to imagine this is the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. The village doctor was Dr. Freeman. He lived right in Ada Village. If you're familiar with the village, his house is still there um, right next to the hardware store. It has a, um, there's a storefront on the house now, but Dr. Freeman would call on her to assist when he needed help in a house call or something in his office, in his home. And as um, her daughter noted, she was always taking care of people. So she, um, she used this passion to care for people and used her training throughout her life, even when she wasn't officially employed in nursing. But really the labor of love for Blanche was in performing. What you're looking at is a poster advertising a performance of hers. And it gives you um, a real clue to what's going on with her, the piano. She um, played piano, that was her instrument. And Ma Loveless and her boys would be the name of the band that took her all around this area playing gigs and uh, is how she became well known. And music the way you like it. She, people enjoyed her music and she um, will talk about the different kinds of music she played, but it was really, um, it was really well received in the community and beyond. And let's look at what she was playing. In Traverse City, her stepmother had her attend the Conservatory of Music, and that's where she learned, and she learned classical piano. As she has moved on to her 20s and 30s, and she's married, and she's now down in Ada, she plays the piano, sometimes solo, but often as the leader of the Ada Danced Orchestra in the 30s and in the 40s, playing dance music. Every Saturday night was the chicken dinner and the dance in the village. And um, people love to hear Blanche Loveless play. But even more so, Ma and her boys was the band that she became so well known um, as part of. They played honky tonk and ragtime and square dances with uh, piano, drums, saxophone, fiddle, she, um, when she first came into uh, her marriage and she and her husband were socializing at the Ada, Ada's Egypt Valley Grange, she um, encountered someone who said, you know, hey, we have a lot of square dances here. Could we entice you to play? I hear you play piano. And, and she said, well, I don't play square dances. I was a classically trained. And he apparently responded that if you can play a chord, we can teach you how to play a square dance. And square dances were really popular at the time at the, at the Granges, the Grange Halls. And so really for the rest of her life, she's playing the square dances and her husband Art is calling the square dances. Just a quote. From the local paper, Ada was too small to have its own paper, but the Lowell Ledger um, reported on activities in Ada. There will, there will be a dance at the Ada rink on Thanksgiving night. Mrs. Blanche Loveless will furnish the music. This is in 1932. Oh, I would just love to attend that. Um, if you are familiar with Ada, the Ada rink was really a glorified barn, I guess. It was a, a storefront where the Ada Grill and Schnitz is today, but um, at times it housed farming equipment for sale, but a lot of times it had some wooden benches you could pull up to show movies or push away to roller skate or have a dance. 
There she is. There's Ma and her boys. This is the band Ma Loveless and her boys playing some gigs, oh, 20, 25 years after that uh, quote from the Lowell Ledger. She's still playing. And here she is with the, um, a lot of the same band members, uh, one or two changes over time. So I did wanna take a minute to talk about the life of a musician. Um, as you can imagine, I mean, she played all over this area, locally in Ada for sure at the Grange or the Ada Rink, the Dixie, the Seville, the Ada Hotel. Um, but she played gigs all over West Michigan. Sometimes a gig might mean rolling back the carpet and playing in people's homes. Sometimes those gigs were a dawn dance where she would play that piano from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And these, again, if you think about it, these are, this is through the depression, the Great Depression. This is through World War II. Um, she's helping people in her community, entertaining them. The nights got late because usually she's playing this gig well into the night, stopping at the Lena Lou restaurant for a sandwich, getting home at two or three in the morning. Uh, but she really, it was a labor of love. Clearly she loved what she did. And let's just take a minute to talk about the fact that she has this daughter that she's raising during this time. And Helen came with her to the gigs. When she was younger, Blanche would bring a bench up behind the piano and lay Helen down there and cover her up and keep playing. It's really um, something that later in life, uh, Helen, her daughter reports, um, the quote is, I've always followed my mother wherever she went because it was a fun time. And I guess you could say it paid off for Helen when she was in her twenties Ma and the boys were playing at a gig out in Alpine Township, not too far from Grand Valley. And uh, it was just during, I believe it was during World War II. And Ma's gig was in a barn on a farm out there. And the farmer's son asked Helen to dance. And Helen's in her twenties at this point. And the rest, as they say, is history. That boy's name was Ed Dunnebach and that they, they would marry, that would become Ellen, uh, Helen's husband. One more story from uh, Life as a Musician and Helen, or um, excuse me, Ma Blanche was playing a gig and she was frustrated because that gig was on the same night as Helen, um, who is now married and having a child was going into labor. And Blanche was frustrated that she had to play a gig that night. And so the family story goes that at 1.30 in the morning, Blanche stopped the music, stopped playing, stopped the musicians and took a pause thinking that her daughter had been, had given birth, that the child had been born. And according to Helen, 1.30 in the morning was when the child was born. So just a special memory from the family um, that was shared by Helen with us in the oral history. Lest you think Blanche is only a traveling musician, she cared about her community and decided to become involved at age 51, she um, was elected township clerk, Ada Township Clerk. It's an elected position. The clerk oversees elections, the township records, serves on the township board. And she served there for 16 years. This is the building here at the corner of Ada Drive and Thornapple River Drive, this little mid-century beauty. It was the township hall from 1950 to 1990 about, and this is where she served. Um, I wanted to just have a little, provide a little snapshot of her time serving on the board. 
uh, from the minutes on April 14, 1945, at the Ada Township Board meeting. Two entries I wanted to take note of. One says Arthur Loveless owed the amount of $1.50 on a cemetery lot. The amount was paid by Blanche Loveless' wife. The other one I wanted to take note of, the other entry in the minutes, says at three o'clock, we, the board, observed one minute of silence in respect to our president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who passed away and whose funeral was held at that time. I think that's a special little reflection from April 14, 1945. Unexpectedly, Blanche passed away in April of 1961, and it happened to be the night before an election. So they managed to scramble to fill in for um, the loss of their township clerk and also quickly put together a write-in candidate to fill her position for the election the next day. And one more thing to note, besides nursing and performing and serving as township clerk, she sold insurance. We have a volunteer who's just shared with me that she has a life insurance that was sold to her mother by Blanche Loveless for 50 cents. The payments were 50 cents. So when thinking about Blanche Loveless, Ma Loveless, I really come back to this all work and no play. Well, Blanche was not a dull woman. She was quite a gal as her son-in-law noted. And I think others would agree because she had a wide variety of interests and abilities that she chose to pursue. She was passionate about these things and indulged in them throughout her life, the length, the length of her life. In mixing business with pleasure, she made a real difference to the lives of many in the Ada community, whether it is keeping them healthy in times of need, um, entertaining them through difficult times in our country's history and the community's history, um, or serving in the community um, as an elected official. As I mentioned, she would have been well known to them if not known well to us today. Um, as by way of a postscript, I was pleased to learn that her legacy is not over. She's not on a dusty shelf somewhere today, but actually um, her legacy has been carried on in a really vibrant way. If you recall, I mentioned that she was playing a gig out in Alpine Township and her daughter came and that is where her daughter met her, her future husband. And today, if you go to that barn where Blanche was playing, you will find this thriving farm. It's wonderful. So that's the barn where Blanche, uh, Ma, Loveless and her boys played. And it still has the um, stage inside where they performed. The farm Ed Dunneback and Girls still has performances, live performances on Friday nights, live performances on Saturdays. They have a summer concert series. And um, Ed Dunneback was Ellen's husband. And the farm is currently run, these girls of Ed Dunneback and Girls are the fourth generation farmers there. And we know that they're great grandmother was a strong woman who accomplished a great deal. And here we are four generations later and the women are running the farm and they are Ma Lovelace's great granddaughters and the granddaughter. So I think it's a special thing to know that that one gig that Ma Lovelace played has resulted, um, continues to serve her legacy today with music and at this farm on Six Mile Road between Fruit Ridge and Peach Ridge, I believe. I just read an article about this farm in February in the um, Lantern, I believe it's called. 
that serves Grand Valley and Alpine area. So I thought this was a, a really unique way to bring the story forward. I was thrilled to see that they're still thriving there and telling her story. If you find them on social media, the family values their legacy and um, post pictures of family history, which is exciting. So I think that is all for my portion today. Well, thank you so much, Kristen. I feel like I've learned a lot and I have so many questions for you too. I wanna to invite uh, both David and Brenda to turn on their cameras um, to get started with some Q and A. Um, I have some questions for each of you as individuals, and then I'll, I'll move into some questions that, um, you guys can just reflect and think about who you want to, um, ask first. But my first question is going to be for you, David. So I'm curious when thinking about, um, Nina's history um, and thinking about sort of how her story gets remembered and gets told. Was there anybody in particular in Ionia kind of focusing on making sure that her memory was kept alive? Um, yeah, I, I definitely have to credit uh, Linda Cianji, who's a former president of the Historical Society and one of our local historians. And uh, she is the one that brought Nina's story to my attention, um, might have been five years ago or so. And uh, as a result of that, uh, um, we did a little research and we looked around on the bookshelves and found that we have some of Nina's original books with her name in them and the whole bit, you know, that uh, history of the library um, and uh, how, how big of a role she played at the library there in Ionia. Oh, wow. I, I guess part of my question also comes from thinking about, has anyone else, I guess, looking at sort of Michi the state history uh, for Michigan, has ever, and has anyone else sort of started looking at sort of her role in the library system at all? We haven't heard anything about that, no. Um, but we uh, actually had a little discussion over coffee one time about uh, how do people get nominated for the Women's Hall of Fame? Mm. And I'm sure somebody will enlighten us about that, but we think, well, she may be a candidate for that because of her involvement in the libraries. Oh, wow, no, that's really helpful. Um, Brenda, I'm thinking about sort of the work that you presented on around Rosie Lee Wilkins. And um, what really struck me is, about, is the fact that the Lakeshore Museum Center um, put up that um, placard around collecting bias. Um, so I'm wondering if, I guess this is a two-part question. First, if you wanna sort of just talk a little bit more about what collecting bias is for folks so they can just have a more fuller understanding of what that looks like. But then also thinking about, um, you know, what kind of future exhibitions or, um, thinking about just the overall collections holding of the Lakeshore Museum Center. Have you guys been thinking about in relation to this collecting bias? So um, our former exhibit designer and I, we attended the um, American Alliance of Museums conference last year. And I think in association with a lot of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, last summer, it was happening right at the same time as AAM. And um, it just became something that we we're more aware of than we had in the past and became so important for us to really look at our collection and who made these quilts and our voice um, as being two white women talking about a black woman. Um, is that part of the problem or part of the solution? And I think for us, the collecting bias is just these gaps that we had. Um, our museum was founded in 1937 um, as a natural history museum and it collects uh, historical household items, um, historical moments, but I was really awakened by it a couple of years ago when um, I first started here and I was contacted by our local chapter of the NAACP. Um, they were celebrating a hundred years of being in Muskegon um, and asked, what do we have in our collection? And we didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. So it's just this constant, um, movement in the future of being more active rather than passive in our collecting. I call the secretary every October now, what can we collect? Um, and being in our community, not just sitting behind our desk, talking to people, looking at what's happening, 
and widening the scope. I mean, it's, you know, it's, we don't have the answers. I don't have all the answers, but it's just really being aware of it and acknowledging it and asking for people to hold us accountable to be better at things. No, that's really helpful. And I appreciate sort of you sharing your perspective in terms of how you even came to sort of thinking about these kinds of questions um, and the work that you're doing. So in thinking about um, her overall, I guess, legacy and impact on the community, was there anything that you came across that was surprising to you as you were doing this research? About Rosie? Um, the fact that I worked with one of her relatives and had no idea, I, I think that was the biggest thing. Uh, we learned a valuable lesson that my coworker does not look at Facebook <laughs> because that's how we were posting, like, do you know this woman? Um, and with COVID, we were so isolated as a staff that we weren't talking to each other. So I think it just was a wake up call internally, but I think that really brought it home for me that anybody you talk to could have this incredible life story. You look at somebody like um, with Kristen and talking about Helen Ma's daughter and, and this legacy now that still exists in the community. Um, and it came up all the time. There were family members, friends that had Rosie's quills. It just, you just don't know. Um, and one of the great granddaughters shared with me that she had recently posted something on her Facebook account uh, on the anniversary of uh, Rosie's birthday. And a lot of her friends were like, I know Rosie, but had no idea that that was her great grandmother. So you just never know. No, I think that's really helpful context. And it's a great segue for my question for Kristen, just thinking about um, Ma Loveless, um, Sarah, Blanche, whatever you wanna, I think, call her. And, and just thinking about her long history within the community mm -hmm. um, and how she seems to be a jack of all trades in many respects mm -hmm. um, that you don't often, or that people historically don't really recognize women um, for having such expertise in a, such a variety of ways and being so deeply um, engaged within their communities. So could you just tell us a little bit more about how you came across um, Ma Loveless and um, why, why her? Like, why did you choose to sort of dig a little bit deeper into her, her history and, and what she means to the Ada community? Well, you know, I guess it started with that picture, the picture that's the poster of her performance. And I dated it, you know, it's probably in the 50s somewhere. And I thought, okay, well, what do people think about Ada? And what does that poster tell me about people living in Ada at the time? And I really liked the idea that um, music brought into it. Now the holy grail would be, can I find a recording of her playing I have not been able to yet. I will continue to try to do that, but I would love to hear that was her work, but then was, you know, so appreciated by the community. I would love a piece of that. But I started pulling the threads on her and listening to the oral history from her daughter. And I just love that ability, um, like the chutzpah that it takes to say, okay, I'm well known as a musician, but now I want to go into, um, you know, the work in township offices, lo local government. And would she be perceived in a way that, you know, well, you can't do that because she clearly wasn't pigeonholed into one role. And she took on this other one and she did it at age 51 as well, which I also really appreciate. I just thought that um, there was there was just a real spark in her and um, the opportunity to look at different facets. Um, and, you know, something we all encounter, it's difficult to find information. And um, she was, I was so surprised to literally on Sunday, I drove out to this farm because I just discovered it existed. And that, um, it's not something that was put away and put on a shelf and closed the door, that it continues. And so now my research can continue and I can learn more about her and get some more pictures and hopefully find some music as well. Well, that leads me into my next question. I really appreciate sort of the way in which all of my questions seem to be having really great segues. <laughs> 
with your, <laughs> with everyone's answers. Um, and I know Brenda discussed this in her presentation um, in terms of thinking about um, the d various resources that were helpful as you guys, as you were conducting this work. Um, but were, were there any other resources, um, David or Kristen, that you guys came across that you didn't necessarily mention in your presentations or even you, Brenda, as well, um, that kind of helped you thread together these various strings in these women's lives? I'll tell you one, one point of frustration was that uh, one of Nina's brothers um, took over the family business here in Ionia, was a scrapbooker and had uh, half a dozen different real thick collections of newspaper clippings and poetry. And, you know, people used to collect that kind of stuff. You could tell a lot about his personality. And so when I started looking into Nina's history, I said, oh, there's got to be some stuff in there in her brother's stuff. Not a word. You would never know. He even had a sister based on what was in that scrapbook. And that was just so frustrating to go through page after page after page. And uh, so that was pretty tough. And and the other thing that surprises me about her being involved in library science and collecting data and preserving data and all this kind of stuff was trying to find photos. It's like she was pretty camera shy. And then there was one of the pictures that I had in the presentation of her with a group of ladies. And you could kind of see she was sort of hiding behind the front row, you know, and you could say, well, maybe she was just not comfortable in front of a camera. You know, some people are like that. But it would have been nice to be able to put a little bit more of a face to her history uh, at the time um, and, and just kind of fill it out. So that was, uh, I guess that was a surprise at my research that there just wasn't more information uh, in there. Now it may be hiding somewhere in a box, but you know, that's, uh, that's part of historical research. Um, the no thing I'd like to note is um, I'm just inspired to learn more about her and I am headed toward the Lowell Ledger to do more work um, Lowell's, the Lowell Museum has a nice resource there of the Lowell ledgers. I want to find some more playbills and more information about her. So when thinking about um, how local history or organizations, museums, uh, historical societies highlight sort of various um, pieces of research folks are doing. Um, is there any plans for either the Ada Historical Society or the Ionia County Historical Society to really highlight these women at all um, within their community? We have uh, a spot in the museum that uh, is kind of a little rotating display about personalities. And uh, it's really just a tabletop, but we try to, to spotlight people in there. And now that I've got some information, you know, we can put together something to, to rotate that in this summer. But uh, we've also had, um, when was that? It was last fall that a local Eagle Scout did for a project, uh, wanted to highlight uh, some of the local uh, prominent people, prominent citizens from the past. And so, we helped with that and we made sure that we were spotlighting um, some of those uh, influential women in our past there as well. So, you know, there's lots of little opportunities we just have to look for um, to, uh, to bring this information to the public. <clears throat> yeah, uh, it, having a platform like this that inspires us to take a look is helpful and then you never know what can come out of it. I like it. So a question for all three of you, are there any other lesser known histories that you're currently researching for future exhibits or just out of your own interest from conversations with folks? Constantly. Yeah. Yeah, yes. one, of, one of my projects that I've been trying to get time to focus on again is I wanted to write a uh, a history of Ionia's first 20 years. Um, at first, I said, I'm going to write Ionia's first century, but that got all out of hand real fast. <laughs> then I said, well, I'll just go the first 50 years. Well, that was way too much. And so I said, all right, volume one, 20 years. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's been, that's been a, a huge task. And the real challenge that I've found is trying to reconcile all the various historical information um, 
like Brenda found with the, the genealogical research, you know, well, all this was wrong. And I find a lot of contradictory stuff. And I find people who have lifted things verbatim from somebody else, but the first source was wrong. And, you know, we've all found that kind of stuff. And it's just, uh, that's taken a lot of, a lot of time. Um, but as we noted in, in years past, there might've been prominent people at the time, uh, like my loveless in the fifties that everybody in the community knew, but today nobody ever heard of it. There's a lot of people like that when you go pre-Civil War that were very, very prominent community, but unless they have a street named after them, and even if they do, you don't know who they were. And I found some really interesting personalities back then that I, I definitely want to try to find more about and families that may still be around today, like, you know, with the Centennial Farms and the roots go way, way back. And uh, so that kind of stuff kind of excites me. And I can get my wife involved too. She's a genealogist. So I can say, hey, find out about this person. And she goes crazy for a couple of weeks and <laughs> helps me find the information. I should have thought about that when I was marrying. <laughs> I mean, that's a really great person to have on hand. Yeah, help. there you are. <laughs> <laughs> I would suggest that the bigger challenge at the moment is getting the word out. We're constantly learning new things. And we've spent particularly the last year doing research um, developing exhibits and, and looking into our community's past, but now our challenge is how do we get the word out? How do we get folks to be able to experience it as museums are closed or reopening, as we have to shift how we share information? I would suggest that's the bigger challenge at the moment. The research and the learning is there. How do we share it best these days? No, Chris, and I think, you know, you're right in terms of how do we share it. I, I always tell people if somebody told me that the Coochie office is going to have a YouTube channel two years ago, I don't know if I would have believed them. It's a whole new world in terms of dissemination. Um, but Brenda, I'm curious, what are you working on right now at the Lakeshore Museum? Well, our upcoming exhibit's called Turtle Travels, but so we're a natural history museum, but uh, we do have um, uh, so a natural history exhibit. And um, but every day I get to learn something new. We are actively collecting, so you never know who's going to call on the phone um, with an amazing thing that they found in their business or in their attic. And I think, much like Kristen, it's how do you exhibit this? How do you share it with people? Um, because that's the business that we're in is this um, display and hoping that people can learn and understand their past um, to help them right now to understand their present and, and plan for a better future. So um, yeah, it's just every day is exciting. What am I gonna learn? I don't know, but we'll find out, so. <laughs> no, that's really helpful. Um, so I, I guess this last question that I have is for all of you as well. Um, what advice do you have based on your experience sort of researching this, the women that you respectively presented on here today? Um, what advice do you have for other organizations or researchers um, as they try to uncover their own lesser known stories? I think one of the difficult things <clears throat> that I found was trying to track down that living legacy the descendants uh, of, of these uh, celebrities from the past that uh, 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 so many people just don't know. They just don't know who their great grandfathers were, or that kind of thing. And it's, um, and particularly great grandmothers. Um, so it's, it's, it's frustrating to not find that sort of a connection and uh, to really have to rely so much on the, the printed word and track that down. But uh, um, we're trying to change that, you know, and I, I, I meet people that uh, might be new to town or younger generation or something. And I just say, oh, you're related to so-and-so. And I go, I don't know. So that's my opportunity. Okay, come here. I'll tell you about your ancestors, you know, mm -hmm. and try to help fill in the, the, the heritage, you know, that hopefully they'd be proud of and, and uh, look for those opportunities to help future historians in their research. I'd like to plant the seed again of um, collecting oral histories. 
they've been so valuable to what I do. And you're really <laughs> giving yourself um, a help. You're helping yourself by collecting that information now. You never know what you're gonna, how it's gonna play out, where it might be valuable in the future. But getting, um, sitting down with folks and having conversations and recording them for the collections, just so valuable. That's been a real big help to me. I absolutely agree with both Kristen and David. I think collecting history now is so important to preparing for the future and talking to people, documenting their legacy, even if it doesn't end up in a historical society or a museum, it's so important to you as a person. And there's great resources out there for you to interview family members and talk to them. Um, and record their stories. I think oral history is so crucial. We could not have found out everything we did about Rosie just looking at documents. We needed those stories from the family that continue to come up with new stories to share with us as they think of things. Um, but there's some stuff that we might never know. And so we, you know, just to emphasize, record your stories, talk to your family and your friends um, and get everything written down. So if, People who are either attending the webinar live or if they're viewing the recording of this, if they have a question about someone in, the, in their community um, that they think deserves recognition, um, I would definitely encourage folks to contact their local historical society or local museum. And, and I'm guessing, is it okay for me to say that if folks have specific questions about Muskegon, Ada and Ionia, that they should get in contact with you all or your respective organizations? Yeah, definitely. Ionihistory.org. Uh, there's a little inquiry form there and, and I'm the guy that reads those emails. So <laughs> it'll come right to me. And I would, the other side of that coin <laughs> is, please reach out if you have information to share with us. We'd like to help you, but also, you know, we don't know what we don't know. So if there's somebody <laughs> on your radar, please reach out and share their story with us so that we can collect that information for future research too. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us this morning. I know I have learned a tremendous amount um, and thinking about the way women have impacted West Michigan history in such a in, in different yet similar ways, thinking about um, not only Nina's work with the libraries and, and what that means when you're taught thinking about sort of other facets of a community, right? So thinking about the role libraries play as some, as some of the most vibrant sites for communities to get together today and sort of what kind of work must have had to go on in the beginning, thinking about uh, what, we've learned about not only women's history and quilting, right, through Rosie Lee Wilkins, but also thinking too about that African-American history story and uh, from the, uh, as part of the great migration and how Muskegon ties into that. But then finally, I think for me, listening uh, to Kristen talk about Ma Loveless, I, I think I really gained a better sense too about how music brought a community together, but how, how also women not only could be these dynamic um, personalities, right, through sort of music, but also take that same level of energy and bring it to um, civic life mm -hmm. and, and what that means. But I think the overarching theme that I realized um, as I listened to all of you is the fact that, you know, if we don't know these women's stories, you know, we wouldn't sort of see the the large um, impact women have in our history. Um, and, and the role that they have in their history. So I really hope that, you know, you continue looking at these women and highlighting their stories and that community members sort of see not only the role that these three women have had shaping West Michigan, but also maybe inspired to look at their own set of women who may be sort of lesser known within their community and want to highlight them. So thank you again, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much to everybody who attended today's webinar. As a reminder, it is being recorded and it will be available online um, later on. We do have one more uh, roundtable presentation and that's uh, scheduled on March 24th. Um, so we're really excited about that. Please check out our website if, 
for more information about how to register if you haven't registered for that final webinar uh, presentation. And so thank you everyone. And you guys have a wonderful uh, afternoon. Thank you, Bye. Kimberly. Thank you.